All right, chapter 22, the quote unquote new era. The decade after World War I is known as the Roaring Twenties in America, and that's just what they did. The decade between 1920 and 1930 was go, go, go. The American economy is booming after World War I. Remember, we were virtually unscathed. Uh, we emerged in a position of global power and dominance. Um, everything from the outside looks good for the United States. However, kind of like the Gilded Era, once you get in beneath the surface, you will find out all is not smooth sailing. America is going to be going through a bit of a transition. Uh, we're transitioning towards a new secular commercial culture. And while outsiders might see the, the, the growth and expanse and the booming economy and think everything is going fine for the United States, that's not really going to be true, and we'll get into that in this chapter. So the broad themes of this chapter, we are going to talk about the causes and effects of the economic boom, and then we are going to get back into politics. And specifically, we are going to talk about the Republican dominance of politics. Remember, from the end of the Civil War, really up through the 1930s, with the exception of two presidents, uh, the Republicans really controlled the federal government. So that's what we're going to be looking at in this chapter. So let's talk about this new society. And as I mentioned, probably the most predominant effect, the, the most visible effect after World War I is going to be the booming economy of the United States. After a very brief post-war recession, and you see this, this is not uncommon, right? During the war, you've got the government pumping huge amounts of money into the economy. They're buying uniforms, they're paying troops, they're buying food and guns and bullets. And then after the war's over, it's like they turn the faucet off, right? That, that flow of money dries up pretty quickly. And so it's not uncommon to see after a major war that there is going to be a, a slight recession. And we do see that in the United States. 1921 to 1922, there, there's a slight recession. But after 1922, the American economy booms uninterrupted for almost 10 years, almost 10 years of straight growth in the United States. By the time we reach the 1930s, the United States is producing almost half of the world's manufactured goods. Well, I say 1930s, by 1929. By 1929, the United States is producing almost half the world's manufactured goods. That's amazing. Uh, we, we will never see that kind of dominance again, uh, at least in our lifetime. It, it's virtually unheard of. And there's a couple of big reasons why we were able to dominate the globe, not just, you know, not just the United States, but the global economy, why we rose to such dominance. Number one was the destruction of European industry. Remember World War I, uh, at that point in time, the most deadly destructive war the world had ever seen. The European factories were bombed out of existence. And so they're relying, that, that's where all of our manufactured goods are going. Um, European nations can't create their own, so they're buying ours. We're shipping our goods into Europe. So that, that is one reason for the huge economic boom. The second reason, though, is because of pretty amazing advances in technology. And we're going to see several new technologies uh, appearing in the 1920s. Things like radios. Radios become the the ubiquitous object in the 1920s. Ubiquitous. They're everywhere. Uh, the radio was the, the TV of the 1920s. It's kind of the idea, no matter how poor the family, almost everyone had access to radio. It was their source of news. It was their source of entertainment. That's what families did. You know, families today, you eat dinner, then you might all gather around the TV to, to watch TV. Back then, families would eat dinner. They would all gather around the radio to hear what's going on. Uh, we see commercial aviation begin to take off. <laughs> take off. Commercial aviation begins to take off for the first time. Uh, we see the very earliest computers and genetic research uh, coming on board in the 1920s. But far and away, the, the most important advancement of the 1920s will be the automobile. Uh, automobiles become incredibly popular in the 1920s, and that, that, that growth of automobiles will spur on the American economy through the 1920s. It'll dip in the 1930s, but then it will come roaring back in the 40s and 50s and 60s. And just think about it. 
what all goes into building a car. So you need steel for the body, you need rubber for the tires, you need oil for the engine and to produce gas. So just producing the car itself is going to stimulate a lot of industry. But then also think you need roads for the the, the car to run on, right? So you have to you have construction jobs and roads. And then as you're building new roads, new towns begin to pop up. You see new stores, new gas stations being built. Uh, tourism becomes pretty popular for really for the first time in the 1920s. And by the time we get into the 20s, America has fully embraced this idea of a mass consumer culture. Uh, we are, are not just buying the things we need for life. Remember, what we spoke about, you know, between the end of the Civil War up to around 1900, America industrializes, right? We, we move away from an agrarian, rural economy into a more urban, industrialized economy. We're no longer sewing our own clothes. We're no longer cooking our own soap. We're no longer growing our own food. Now we go out and work wages in a factory. We go out and make a, you know, 10 cents an hour, we've got a job, and then we take that money, and then we buy the stuff that we need. So we're not producing the stuff we need ourselves. We're going to work in a factory, getting a paycheck, and then buying the stuff we need. Okay, by the time we've moved into the 1920s, we're no longer just buying the things we need. Now we're buying things to make our life easier. We're buying refrigerators, we're buying washing machines, we're buying wristwatches. We're buying cars. You know, nobody really needed a car back then. It was a, it was a, a, uh, it was a luxury object, right? Things for pleasure, not that you had to sustain life, but things that made your life easier. And as I mentioned, vacations become big for the really first time in American history because you've got that defined time off. People know I'm going to have Fourth of July off. People know I've got a week's worth of vacation coming from my job. Um, so vacations become big. Leisure time becomes big in the United States. Advertising becomes huge. It becomes a business in and of itself. The job of advertising is not just making people aware of the products. It's not just telling people, hey, here's our bar of soap. You know, we are now producing a bar of soap. It's available to buy. Advertising is in the, the business of telling people how their product will make your life better. Here's our bar of soap, buy it, and this is what's going to happen to you, right? So it's not just about here's our product, it's here's how our product's going to make you better. Some of the reasons advertising becomes so big are advances in national communication, national chain newspapers, mass circulation magazines, movies. Really, 1920s is the, the first the first era that movies become uh, pr a pretty big deal in American culture. For example, the Motion Picture Association of America is founded in the 1920s. It's the first time we have full-length motion pictures in the 1920s. Eventually, we will get into the you know the so-called talkies, movies with sound. Uh, radios, however, that will still be the the preeminent form of mass communication. We see that the birth of national radio networks. We see this is really the first time that we see the birth of a celebrity culture in the United States. You know, it's not just something that came out of the 1990 and 2000s. Uh, people have always obsessed over celebrities in the United States. That goes all the way back to the 1920s. Uh, we see roles for women continue to change. More and more women are being educated. More and more women are being accepted into public schools. However, um, even though women may be graduating from those schools within education, we will see that the jobs are not always there. Education did not always result in a job because the jobs that were available for women, as we've mentioned previously, are still, uh, women are discriminated against. Uh, they're, they're pushed towards jobs in fields like teaching and nursing, um, secretaries and receptionists. Um, and it's not just women. Uh, public education in general uh, is becoming pretty important in the United States. This is really the first time that we have the idea of a separate youth culture. You know, looking back at your, your great-grandparents or your great-grandparents and, and the age that they started their families, 
you know, a, a girl could have been, you know, 17 years old and had already been married and was, was, you know, making a family with her husband. Today, that that's considered out, you know, that, that that's not the norm today, right? Um, back then, if you were a, you know, barely, a person barely out of childhood, we're talking 13, 14, 15 years old, you might have been expected to go out and get a job to help support your family. It's really only as we move into the 1920s that we begin to envision this idea, okay, you have a, you are a child, you know, it's your job to get an education. I mean, you look at today, I think most people would probably agree that adulthood, you know, quote unquote adulthood, it's hard to put a number on it, but I think most people would say probably somewhere between the range of, you know, 16, you get your driver's license, 18, you graduate high school, you know, 21, um, that, that's the last, you know, sort of legal barrier uh, that, that you have as an adult. So, you know, somewhere in that age, I think probably 18 to 21, uh, most people would say that under those ages, you are still a kid. That, that really goes back to the 1920s, that we have this separate youth culture that, you know, the line between a, being a child and being adult is not nearly as blurred uh, as it was back then. Um, but anyway, going back to changing roles for women, uh, we see women in the 1920s begin moving pretty stridently away from Victorian values. You know, uh, there was this idea, out in Victorian values, Queen Victoria out of England, uh, this idea that women should be seen and not heard, that women followed this, this path in their lives. You, you start out as, as the loyal daughter who takes care of her dad and her family and then from there you move on into the household of your husband and you begin to take care of him and you begin to take care of your children. Uh, rather than following that prescribed path, uh, these new women who had the nickname Flappers, uh, they, they took a different path and they, they moved, like I said, they moved away from those Victorian values. They wore short dresses. They, they went out at night and fraternized with men. They smoked, they drank, they danced. Um, it, it, they, they rebelled is what they were doing. They were rebelling against this life, this culture that society said that they should be doing. So again, we see changing roles for women. But we also see some bad things, right? Uh, we also see some uh, some steps back in the 1920s. This stress on education as public schools become more and more important and more and more prevalent in the United States. A, a lot of people began to have the idea, you know, at one point in time, the American dream, you go out, you get a job, you work hard, you, you pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. The self-made man, that was the American dream, right? Someone who is independent. Americans have always had this fiercely independent streak. I don't need help from anybody. If I just apply myself and I work hard, I can make something out of myself. Well, in the 1920s, that kind of fell by the wayside. The idea was now you can't just work hard. You have to have an education. You know, it's not enough to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You can't make yourself. You've got to have that helping hand. Some people come become completely disillusioned with society. People start looking at the society that, that's growing and changing around them, uh, this focus on conspicuous consumption, and they, they just feel completely alienated from it. They, they refer to themselves as the so-called lost generation. Now, it's not all doom and gloom, and as a matter of fact, uh, we, we see a pretty spectacular art movement um, come out of black America known as the Harlem Renaissance. Harlem um, in New York is kind of the unofficial capital of, of black America. And we see this vibrant cultural community grow up and, and out of Harlem, uh, a community of artists and authors and poets uh, who wrote about the, the quote-unquote new Negro who rejected stereotypes and said that through intellect and producing art and through education, black Americans could rise up above racism. Uh, for really the first time in African American history in the United States, uh, they began to explore the roots of the African American experience. Um, Africa, the rural South, uh, urban life. So that this pretty spectacular art movement uh, arose out of Harlem in the 1920s.
However, all in all, the, the, the primary focus of the 1920s is going to be on this so-called American way of life. Uh, and I think I've already mentioned this before. Uh, people are enamored. People are in love with this American way of life. The idea high wages, efficient factories, high technology, a high standard of living. You know, America is the best. We have the best government. We have the best economy. We won World War One. America is the best. Go America. And who do people uh, credit with this? Well, they credit Wall Street. What's giving us this American way of life? Who's giving us these high wages that we can both go out and buy all this great stuff? Who's giving us jobs in these efficient factories? Who's producing this high technology that's making our lives easier now? Who's doing all of this? Well, it's Wall Street. People begin to glorify Wall Street, and that that's kind of a that's an ominous sign for the United States because there are limits to this prosperity. Now, I will say most people in the United States are probably benefiting from this economy. Everybody's doing at least a little bit better, but there is going to be a maldistribution of wealth, and we'll talk more about this in the coming chapters, um, but it's kind of like the 1890s. Some people are getting really, really, really rich. Some people are getting a little bit less poor, okay? A maldistribution of wealth. It, it's not fair and it's equal. I'm not, I'm not saying that it should be fair and equal, but I'm saying that if you... I should have drawn a graph. You know, it, it is a sharply rising line. Um, some people, the, the rich are getting even richer and the working poor are getting a little bit less poor. So yes, everyone's doing better, but some people are doing a lot better than some other people. The, the distribution of wealth is going to be very unequal. We'll see that farming is going to face a recession. I, I said farming is very much boom or bust, right? You've got really good years, you've got really bad years. Well, moving into the 1920s, farming is going to see a few bad years. And part of this does have to do with advancing technology. Uh, farmers are, uh, there's mechanization, right? People are, are buying combines, they're buying tractors, uh, they're utilizing this new technology. And what happens, there's actually two things that happen as a result of this. Number one, uh, you don't need as many farmhands anymore. Uh, so we will actually see a number of farmers lose their job because they're simply not needed, you know. Whereas, and I'm just making numbers up now, you might have had 10 farmhands to work 100 acres. Now one farmhand with a tractor can work that same 100 acres. And so uh, you don't need as many agricultural workers anymore. And number two, even though we have fewer you know, farm workers, we're producing too much food. Uh, technology has grown to the point that we are producing more food than the market needed and of course the law of supply and demand and the more there is of something the less it's worth right uh, so farmers are producing too much food the market can't absorb it all and so it's driving the price down and so their response to that and again we'll get into this in, in the coming chapters their response to that is well if I'm only a you know, if I was making a dollar a bushel last year, and now I'm only making 75 cents a bushel, I've got to produce even more bushels to, to make the same amount of money. That was their response. They didn't realize that the reason the market was down is because they're producing too much food. So farmers are, are facing some bad times. Workers are begin to face some bad times. And, and not necessarily because things are so bad for American factories, because they're not. Things are, are booming. So the reason that some workers are um, facing bad times is because labor unions are losing their clout. And part of that has to do with the rising standard of living. It's very hard to, uh, to keep that passion going, right? It's hard to keep that fire going to, to unionize and, and fight for your rights and you know go on strike against factors it, it's very hard to keep that passion going when times are good you know it, it's one thing when times are bad and you can't put food on the table and you feel like you're being exploited you know it's one thing to get people fired up about that but now that times are good now that things are going better people are looking around and saying well what are we fighting for we're getting everything that we wanted right we've got better working hours 
we're, we're making more money, we've got improved working conditions, and also we've got this thing called welfare capitalism. Welfare capitalism is a pretty smart move by big business in the United States. It, it's the idea, <laughs> welfare capitalism, it's the idea that in order to prevent unions from forming and going on strike, you give the workers what they want. So think about that for a second. Welfare capitalism, in order to keep unions out of your shop, you give the workers what they want. You give them a shorter work week, you give them pensions, you give them uh, things known as company unions, unions that are sponsored by the business itself. And that sounds great, right? Because that's what, you know, that the workers want that and they're getting it without having to fight for it. So everybody was happy. The problem was, though, was that welfare capitalism really depended on times being good, okay? Because the business was happy to give these things when times were good and they could afford to do so. But when times were bad, as we will see happen in the next few chapters, when times get rough, the company begins taking that stuff away. And now all of a sudden, the workers don't have the union there to stand in for them. They don't have the protection of that union because they, they never formed it in the first place because they relied on the company. So what the company gave, the company could take away. It all sounds good and it is good when everybody is, is making money and there's you know, there's enough to go around, but welfare capitalism only works when times are good. We see the, the women's movement begin to splinter in the United States. You know, and it's kind of the same deal. When there is a unifying goal, it's, it's easy to get everyone on the same page. For years and years and years, the goal of feminists in the United States had been the right to vote. Now, all of a sudden, the 19th Amendment is ratified, uh, 1920 rolls around, and women have the right to vote. And so the thing that had united all of these feminist uh, groups all across the country for so long, they've got it. They, they, they won, right? And now they, they begin to look at each other and begin to ask, well, what's next? And that's where it begins to splinter, because some groups want to do this. Some groups want to do that. Some groups want to do these other things. And so they no longer have that unifying goal that they could, that, that gave them passion, that gave them fire for so long. Now, all of a sudden, they don't know what to do with themselves. Um, we will see a, a particularly bitter debate was over the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, some women's group took up the torch, you know, we got the, the right to vote. Now we want a constitutional amendment that a woman must be treated exactly the same as a man. Now, the ERA has never passed. Uh, people began talking about it in the 1920s, and they've continued to talk about it since then. It, it's a very bitter um, debate. And, you know, on, on the face of it, it doesn't seem very controversial, right? Uh women should be treated the same as men. You know, I, I don't think anybody has a problem with that. But then you get into things such as, well, uh, something in the news today, not today, but here recently, uh, should women be required to register for the draft for selective service? Well, currently, no, they do not. Now, I, they just passed a law that, that they might have to, but currently women don't have to register for the selective service. Under something like the Equal Rights Amendment, they would. So it, there are some controversies associated with it. We began to see this retreat from progressivism. You know, one of the goals of progressivism was to broaden political um, participation, right? They wanted more people involved in the political process, more people running for office, more people voting. Well, we began to see a retreat from that in the 1920s. Uh, people become convinced that a lot of people are unfit for democracies. Uh, we see these new tests develop to measure a person's intelligence quota, you know, an IQ test. People begin taking these IQ tests, which, by the way, uh, I, I don't think that there's any test that uh, IQ, I don't think there's any uh, research that proves an IQ test means you're smarter one way or the other. But IQ tests are developed in the 1920s and people began taking them and, and they began thinking that maybe people aren't as smart as people <laughs> thought that they were. Um, 
people begin to point out that, hey, people would rather watch a, a baseball game or people would rather go to a, a boxing match than to run for office, right? People are not smart enough. They're too easily misled by advertising, right? Advertising is becoming huge in the 1920s. And, you know, politics seem to, uh, to bear this out. Uh, with the fall of machine politics, remember the goal of machine politics was to get people out to vote for your guy. Well, now that you know, or now that people aren't being paid to vote, now that they're not being bribed to vote, people are staying home. So with the demise of machine politics, participation goes into a nosedive. This is the beginning of really low voter turnouts for the United States. And part of that is, number one, they're, they might not be being paid anymore to go out and vote. But the other thing is people don't believe that it matters. The general consensus is if it's a southern election, the Democrats going to win. And if it's a national election, the Republicans are going to win. That People say, why do I have to go out and vote? I live in Arkansas. I know a Democrat's always going to win. Why do I have to get out and vote? A Republican's running for president. He's always going to win. So, yeah, well, we definitely see a decline of political participation as we move through the 1920s. So let's talk about politics for a little bit. The Republican era. From 1921 until 1932, the national government will belong to the Republicans. A big part of this has to do with the splintering of the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party is no longer unified. On one side, you have small farmers and fundamentalist Christians in the South. And on the other side, you have immigrants and urban workers in the cities. And these two sides cannot come to an agreement on what they should be fighting for. And since the, the Democrats can't unify, the Republicans are always going to win the election. Um, and so once in control, Republicans are going to follow a traditional business-friendly agenda. They begin to lower taxes on both income and businesses. Uh, they support high tariffs. That, that's in, Remember, that's import taxes. So foreign-made goods are more expensive. And, of course, they also go after labor unions. They definitely go after labor unions. By and large, the, the overwhelming goal of Republicans is to keep government out of business. They believe that business operated on a natural cycle. That they believe that you know laws that govern nature also governed business. It was almost a, a living, breathing thing. And yes, sometimes there are low points, but there's also high points. And it's the job of government to stay out of it. That was their argument. That that was the the most repeated Republican mantra of the 1920s is to keep the government out of business. Business has a natural rhythm. Business has a natural cycle. And the Republicans would argue that when the government got involved in it, they just messed things up. So that was the job of government to stay out of business. So Republicans on the national stage, we will see after Woodrow Wilson. Remember when we last left Wilson, he had suffered a stroke. He was in really bad health. Um, the Republicans came in with their return to normalcy campaign and they won overwhelmingly. Warren G. Harding is going to be elected president in 1920. Uh, he is a senator from Ohio. Now, Harding sometimes gets a bad rap. Uh, you know, every so often you will see a list of the most, uh, you know, that they rank the presidents, right? And so the, the top of the list is almost always like Abraham Lincoln and George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, right? Those are the, the usual suspects at the top of the list. Well, somebody's got to be at the bottom of the list, and more often than not, that's Warren G. Harding. He's usually regarded as a pretty ineffective president because he wasn't the most able politician. He wasn't the, the best man for the job. And so what happened was, once he and we saw this with Ulysses S. Grant, once he became president, he brought with him all of his buddies and friends from Ohio as advisors. In fact, they were known as the Ohio Gang. And the problem was, Warren G. Harding himself was not corrupt. However, a lot of his friends were. And so his administration, maybe not he himself, 
but definitely his administration got a reputation as being a very corrupt presidency. For example, the, the Teapot Dome scandal. The Teapot Dome was a naval oil reserve. It was oil we had set aside for use by the Navy in the event of an emergency. Well, Harding took control away from the Navy and gave it to the Department of the Interior. Uh, one of his good buddies was Secretary of the Interior. His name was Albert Fall. And instead of leaving that oil reserve there for the Navy in case of an emergency, he began selling it. Uh, he began selling it in secret. Uh, eventually, uh, half a million dollars richer, he's discovered. And, of course, he gets in trouble. But that's the, the sort of scale. I mean, half a million dollars in 1920 would be a huge sum today. Um, that, that's the, the scale of the, the corruption that Harding has to deal with in his administration. Harding is actually, he, he doesn't last a full term. He's going to die suddenly in 1923. Uh, he's on a speaking tour of the West, and uh, he dies in 1923. His vice president, Calvin Coolidge, is going to take over. Coolidge will serve out the, the remainder of his term. He had less than a year left. Uh, and then he will run for re-election in 1924. And Coolidge is going to follow the same blueprint. B passive. Don't get the government involved in business. No regulation, no interference. Keep government out of business. Uh, by far, the most prominent member of both Coolidge's and he actually served for Harding as well, uh, his cabinet was this guy, Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover was the Secretary of Commerce. Hoover was a really interesting guy. He was an engineer by trade. He was a self-made millionaire, incredibly intelligent individual. He had an international, he built an international reputation for himself. Uh, during World War I, he organized food drives to help feed Europe. So he is an international superstar. And his, his views on business, I mean, obviously he's the Secretary of Commerce. He's going to be very involved with business. Uh, his views on business are, are uh, exactly the, the Republican thinking of the 1920s. He becomes known for his policy of associationalism. Instead of government regulation, instead of government interference, his argument is business should regulate itself. Uh, it should be voluntary regulation. Voluntary cooperation in the private sector will stabilize the economy. So it wasn't that the government is coming in and saying this is what's best for the American economy. It's the actual business leaders themselves should all get together in an association, that's where it comes from, associationalism, that they should voluntarily say, okay, this is what's going on in our markets. This is what we need to do to keep everything healthy. Keep the government out of it. Let business run itself. Very hands-off. Very hands-off. All right, we'll come back to that in just a little bit. Let's talk about uh, these culture wars of the 1920s because, as it turns out, America is changing, right? We're moving from an agrarian rural society, and I think I mentioned this before, 1920s, that's kind of the tipping point. We've been looking at this movement for a long time, probably back before the Civil War. We have been slowly transitioning from an agrarian rural society into an urban industrial society, and the 1920s are really the tipping point. It's the, the time where we go from, mo from more people living in an agrarian rural society into an industrial um, urban society. It's, it's that switch over from you know, over 50% of, of one to the other. And it turns out not everyone's crazy about this new urban, this new secular culture. Specifically, evangelical Protestants are concerned about the decline of traditional values and the rise of this new secularism. Secular means non-religious. So evangelical Christians in the United States are scared that the country is moving away from its religious roots. And this has been a uh, this has happened periodically throughout the United States history, right? going back to the, the original Great Awakening, uh, through the Second Great Awakening, right? Um, there's always been concerns, you know, we're back and forth, back and forth um, with 
uh, regard to our religious roots. So, okay, here is America beginning to secularize, continuing to secularize, and not everyone's happy with the new culture. And so as a, uh, as a counter effect to this, to, to combat this, we see the rise of religious fundamentalism. So it, it's, it's a polarization, right? Some people are moving away from religion. Some people are getting really, really, really into religion, hyper-religious, right? So we have the religious fundamentalists on one side and the new secularists on the other side. And probably the best example of this is the so-called Scopes Monkey Trial. Scopes Monkey Trial in 19, I want to say 20, yeah, 1925. What happened was Tennessee passed a state law. The state law of Tennessee said that you could not teach the biological theory of evolution in high schools. You were not allowed to teach evolution. And the, the reason for that was a rise in religious fundamentalism. Uh, the fundamentalists in Tennessee said that the earth was created in seven days, seven, you know, literally seven 24-hour periods. And that did not fit with the theory of evolution, and so you couldn't teach it. Well, John Scopes, he, he did it intentionally, okay? This wasn't by accident. Somebody wanted to challenge the law. They asked Scopes if he would teach it, and he said yes. So he goes into the classroom. He intentionally breaks the law, and then he's arrested for it. And this becomes the celebrity trial of the 1920s. Um, it, it becomes famous not only in the United States, but all over the world, really. Uh, the, the two attorneys that are working in this trial, Clarence Darrow is the attorney for the defense. He's the most famous defense attorney in the United States. And the prosecuting attorney is our old friend, William Jennings Bryan, who is nearing the end of his life, as a matter of fact. Um, after this trial, he will not live very long at all. But anyway, here are these two greats of American you know, jurisprudence, and they're squaring off against each other, and they're making arguments for one, uh, you know, one way or the other. In the end, nothing really happens. John Scopes was found guilty of breaking law. He knew he broke the law, but that was never the question. The question was, was the law valid in the first place? Well, they found him guilty of breaking the law, and they didn't even look at the question as to whether or not uh, the, the law was valid. And later, I think he was fined a hundred dollars, and it was later overturned on a technicality. Um, but it's just the the fact that this was such a huge trial in the United States. Uh, they later made a movie about it with Spencer Tracy, um, based on it at least. Inherit the Wind. If you've ever seen that movie, it's a pretty good movie. Uh, it's based on the Scopes Monkey Trial, and again, it's just an example of these culture wars. Another example, prohibition. With the passage of the 18th Amendment, alcohol became illegal to manufacture, possess, or imbibe in the United States. Again, it's another sign of religious fundamentalism. Uh, this temperance movement in the United States that had been gathering steam probably by decades at this point finally comes to fruition with the ratification of the 18th Amendment. Uh, prohibition, as it was known, was a huge failure with the United States. Um, they never had enough officers to regulate it. Um, it's still very easy to get alcohol in the United States. It allowed for really the, the first time organized crime uh, to rise in the United States. That, that's how things like the mob and the mafia uh, grew so powerful. They, they grew up out of uh, rum runners. They, were, they brought alcohol illegally into the United States. People tried to make their own alcohol. They got sick from from drinking uh, bathtub gin, as it was known, from moonshine. Uh, people tried to drink industrial solvents and cleaners. That will not work. Uh, prohibition was a, a pretty bad deal for the United States. And of course, as we know, it will later be overturned in the 1930s, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, we see the rise of a new Ku Klux Klan. Now, I do want to point this out. The, the KKK of the 1920s is not the KKK of the Civil War era. The, the Ku Klux Klan of the Civil War era was stamped out by the Federal Army. Uh, Grant, uh, in the Enforcement Acts, he, he set the army against the KKK and basically burned it out. This KKK of the 1920s is very different than the KKK of the Civil War. Um, it's not just in the South anymore. 
the KKK is huge in the United States. It is massively popular in the 1920s. You, I, you know, I, I've seen estimates anywhere four, five, six million people joined this KKK. Um, in fact, it, it was almost, I say it's not just in the South, it's still incredibly popular in the South, but it's not just in the South anymore. Um, but I've seen it, it said that virtually, it's virtually impossible to be a Southern male and, and not be a part of this new Ku Klux Klan. As a matter of fact, uh, there have been a couple of American presidents who um, was theorized that they were actually members of this KKK because it couldn't have been avoided. Uh, was the argument that if you were a, a male in a certain place at a certain time, you almost had to join the KKK. I mean, I'm getting off point. The, the thing that separates this Ku Klux Klan from the old one, um, yes, that they still um, offered violence to African Americans, that they still discriminated and segregated against African Americans, but not just, that's what I mean, it's not just African Americans, um, immigrants. Religious minorities such as as Jews or Catholics or virtually anyone that they thought threatened the American way of life, even even if you were white. So, example, uh, fathers that drunkenly beat their children might get a visit from the KKK because that's not an American thing to do. Uh, promiscuous women. Uh, might get a visit from the KKK because that's that that was out of line with American values, right? So this new KKK targeted not only black people in the United States, but anyone that they thought threatened American values. Um, so, you know, it's really kind of unreal. You have the KKK, they might be running a toy drive for underprivileged children at Christmas time. And they might also be burning crosses on someone's lawn, right? So it's, it's a very odd organization. And part of this is a growth of nativism, right? Immigrant labor isn't as needed anymore in the United States. Mechanization, we don't need as many workers as we used to. Congress began to set quotas on who could immigrate to the United States. We see the birth of the Border Patrol in the 1920s, so nativism becomes a pretty strong force uh, during this time period. Okay, so that brings us up to the election of 1928. And we'll see the golden boy of the Harding and Coolidge administrations, Herbert Hoover. As I mentioned, he's a self-made millionaire. He was a, a member of both Harding's and Coolidge's cabinets. He's going to run against the Democrat um, Alfred Smith. Alfred Smith is notable. He's the first Catholic to run for a major party in the United States. And Hoover wins easily, right? Uh, people have enjoyed a booming economy for the past nine years. Uh, and they think that you know Hoover was a big part of that and under continued Republican leadership, that booming economy would continue into the 1930s. And of course, as we know now, um, they were wrong. And that's where we'll get into in uh, chapter 23.